I will talk about development of signature style. So maybe what I will tell you first is a little bit of my background. Um, I come from Slovenia where I studied uh, industrial design and then I came to London to do uh, MA in jewellery and metalwork. And uh, after I finished college, I didn't have a job, no one wanted to employ me. So what I decided to do is to set up my own business. And when I set up my own business, I started coming across many different kind of difficulties. Um, you know, not just from kind of trying to establish your own style, which I think is a key component to being a successful. One of the reasons is that basically that's something that defines you in the market. And it's specifically important in jewellery, more so than in the other disciplines, maybe in other fashion accessories. Because with jewellery, there's no, no such thing as putting a big logo like what they do on the bags or possibly even on scarves. But with jewellery, it needs to be something that's recognisable because of the way how it's shaped or how it's made or something that sets you apart from um, other people. Now, establishing your own style is something that's very different to working for a brand, for example. I worked for Cartier for 10 years and that was a totally kind of different story because what you do, you extract the DNA of the brand and you uh, bring forward certain elements that are part of that brand and you play with those. But when you're kind of establishing yourself as a designer or as a maker, you need to create your own language. So I'll show you uh, through my history a little bit what I learned and about lots of mistakes that I did. So this was the, one of the first collection, not the first one, but one of the first ones down the line. On the top you see it says season, autumn winter 99, which is how fashion works, which basically means that I designed that in autumn winter 98. And what I tried to do, because I'm kind of naturally very lazy with making things, I hate being at the bench for hours and getting my fingers burned. So I try to uh, utilize the techniques that I learned with my industrial design background. So one of the things I started using is photo etching. Photo etching is fantastic because basically I designed all the different things on the computer, on a flat sheet of paper, and then I sent it out to photo etch and it came out looking like I spent hours piercing those little things. So all I needed to do is just polish the edges, bend it, and that was it. Um, then the following season I actually noticed that I can do more or less the same kind of designs but do it for example in acrylic which you see on the slide uh, on the left and that's when I realized that I can start translating same ideas through many different medias. Then I start using the ones in the bottom you see it's the rubber and the ones on the top it was the seven since bands they were basically laser cut rubber put into this kind of silver tubes which each of the sin was engraved. This was one of my first successes. We sold over thousands of these bands. However, the rubber was breaking like no tomorrow, and I think we had something like 800 returns. So first success, first disaster. Then the following year, I started experimenting more with chains, and I had this idea that I need to find prefabricated kind of components, because I realized that making things from scratch is um, quite costly. So I started playing with chains and particularly this chain which is very flat and started soldering them together. Still keeping with this very streamlined uh, minimal look. And then also started using square rods and flat profiles into which I would solder those chains to create different shapes. Then I started experimenting not just with chains but using the prefabricated components and putting like some kind of rubber string to create various shapes and I started also utilizing laser cutting on leather which is something that was quite successful again the leather came already razor cut all I need to do is I've, I manufactured those silver clasps put them together and that was quite successful actually then I went back again to photo etching and started playing more with inlay so in this case was uh, this was quite a furniture inspired range with lots of wood veneer instead of laser cutouts. And then I started combining the perspex, which was laser cut, with the silver thing. So I'm starting to kind of combining things more together. This was a range that was acrylic material called um, Velbex. It's something like a very shiny rubber that's used by firemen in UK. I don't know why. 
but it's a great material because you can cut it. This was all hand cut because it was very, it was very straight lines. It was very easy to cut, and then you just heated it up. And when it's heated, you could mold it over a certain thing, and it kept the shape. So it actually did look like a flower. And again, I used the same clasps that I used with the leather pieces. This was the first time I actually started making bags, and then I started realizing maybe I should do bags with something that I already know how to make, which was uh, perspex kind of um, manufacturing and molding. Those bags were quite unfunctional. They didn't have any lining, so every time you would open it, everything would fall out. So I started to learning that bag needs to be a really functional item. And this collection was um, one of the first more successful jewelry collections. So it was combining what I learned with chain, which was soldering chain together. These chains, particular chains, got a square rectangular profile, which are linked together, which lends itself beautifully to soldering and photo etching. At that time, I also realized that I can utilize any kind of shape that I want in photo. It doesn't have to be something that's very geometric. It can be also very, very detailed. So I started playing with these butterflies and then bending them so it looked like they were a little bit more uh, kind of alive, flying almost on these chains. And I started at that time also to understand how to create a range because I started to get lots of feedback from buyers. And they'll say, oh, you know, it's good to have all these big pieces that do really well in press. However, most people don't really like wearing this kind of big thing, so you have to do something that's a bit smaller. So I started creating like bracelet, what you see on the right and the bracelet on the left. So I kind of understood that majority of the people don't really like wearing big things, which I personally do. Same with the earrings, smaller version of an earring and a bigger one. And then also, again, I translated the same motif from photo etched metal components to the vinyl. And I started playing again with assembled components. Assembled components are great if you can make them your own because they already exist. They kind of so it means a much kind of faster production line and um, also they're kind of much cheaper rather than having things stamped or photo etched. Um, this was kind of attached just where you see those beads, so the whole thing is kind of trembling. It's moving around, so it doesn't actually stick in your neck because the things actually pull out from the neck when you wear it. And um, after the success of the butterflies, I thought, okay, let's try something else that's natural. What is my favorite flower? So that was um, Anturium at the time. So I thought, okay, this is going to be super successful. Unfortunately, it didn't do as well as butterflies. And the reason why I think it was is because of the protruding nature of the stem and also because the, the flower is quite pointy. It's not as rounded as butterfly. And again, I combined it with the material for which I became known, this kind of shiny rubber vinyl. Then I went back to photo etching kind of more geometric shapes, which I always liked. And this range is something that I particularly like. However, I did really badly with the buyers, um, except a few pieces, maybe some earrings, smaller earrings. And that time I started asking myself, why are certain items doing better than the others? And I started to understand that something that's pointy, like for example with the with the triangles and with the anthurium will never do something as good as something that's rounded like a butterfly or a circle. And here we go, my first functional bag was called Bag 04. Uh, it was combining perspex, for which I was quite well known for, and the leather. This bag, what you see now is folded, but you can unfold it and it becomes like quite a large kind of tote. And this bag actually got copied by quite a large fashion house. Then this was another laser cut leather range. Again, I thought, okay, let's try natural motif. Again, wasn't so successful as the butterflies, again, because I think it was pointy. And then I went back to chains and prefabric components. So all the items you see on the left, they're all strips of metal that you can buy, and they were just cut. And on the right, was combining with a chain. All the items that were with chain, like the earrings that you see on the left and the ones you see, saw before on the right, did really well, whereas the items like the necklace and the bracelet flopped. So at that time I was starting to understand that people actually like chain, and the reason why they like chain is because it's very sensual, it moves and it's soft, as opposed to something that's very stiff, like the strips on the right. Again, more experimenting with chain. I soldered many different strands of chain together to create this kind of flexible, almost mesh-like fabric. 
And I started playing with um, more crystal stones. This is kind of the beginning where I started utilizing more stones because before it was all just kind of purest materials. So I soldered these kind of cups uh, onto the chain kind of structure. And then I went back to photo etching with very rounded motifs and utilizing enamel as well. Uh, this collection was quite successful, especially with simpler items like the hoop earrings where they don't have too many components, which is better than the earrings on the left. And that's the first time I started using the same photo etched technique on the bags. So whatever I do with jewelry, I'm starting to make on the bags. And I think that's something that actually established my style in a way, because when you see something the same on the bag, it becomes recognizable also on the jewelry. So you kind of, exp uh, you kind of like tell your audience that this is really something that's mine. So we did those bags also with the chain and with the clutches, with the kind of the same kind of motif as on the jewelry. And then I just, uh, this is the first time I started just making purses and bags with different kind of plates that didn't necessarily relate to the jewelry because by that time, this technique became also kind of known as something that I became known for, bags with plates. Um, High Street tried to copy it a lot. However, fortunately, these plates are very expensive to make. So however hard they tried, they couldn't actually get it to the right um, price for the High Street. This season, spring, summer of five, was the first time when I launched uh, what is called the Marina Collection. This was born from lots of years of experimenting with chain. And actually what you see is very simple, but it took a really long time to figure out and it got copied so much. Even my chain manufacturing is copying this style now. And the, re the reason why I did that is basically this chain, which you see on the left, is a crown-shaped chain. And I, I realized that if you open that crown, you can hook it to another crown. So you basically get a seamless circle. And it's really simple once you see it. But before that, I haven't seen that anywhere. So it took actually a really long time. So once I've done it, I realized I can loop these chains. And then this chain is also very light. And it's not just one chain. It's many different chains in this kind of family with different shapes and different textures. And it's very flexible, so I started to realize what you see on the pendant on the right, that you can loop this chain, and it actually stays looped really well. So what I did on the right is uh, something that was called La Rotella bracelet. So I started looping the chains and soldering them next to each other, like a parallel lines, and also looping them around uh, the fitting. And then I did the first bags, this chain. This bag, that this bag did really well. It was called the Laratella bag. It was a nightmare to make. We had to make if we had to have a jewelry manufacturer making the, the 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 jewelry components. Then we had to have different leathers with snake and lamp. Then we had to get all these components at the same time. All the leathers had to arrive at the same time. And also because this chain is quite hollow, it's not the same as a plate. Because a plate on a on a bag, you can bash it about and it still stay around. However. These chains were kind of something a bit more fragile, so we had lots of problems with it and sometimes uh, rejects as well. So I started playing more with different types of chain in that whole family. Some are kind of more shiny, some are more matte, some have different kind of hooks. But all of them were kind of all about this looping, knotting and soldering parallel chains one next to the other. Those two bracelets are both kind of seamless. Um, they don't have a clasp. They're basically just kind of bangles that you kind of put on. And because of this crown-shaped nature of this chain, it's also slightly elasticated in a way, so you can easily put it on a hand and then it stays. And then also what I learned from the butterflies that we need some smaller items, because not everyone wants to wear a big bangle. So I used the same family of chains, but thinner ones to kind of create knots. It was fantastic for doing earrings because this chain is very light because it's hollow. So you can do something that's really big and quite voluminous, uh, but still keep the weight down. So it's really wearable. So I tried more in over many different seasons. Now it's autumn, winter of six. And uh, the necklace you see on the right, it utilized almost every single chain that was available in that range. We started to experiment with different things. And the one that's on the left was one of the simpler items. However, it became one of the best sellers. It was called uh, Rosetta Necklace. So it's got two chains. It's got a knot that's made of three interlinking 
loops in a way, like a trinity ring is, I would get, I guess. And then some smaller items again. Now, after all those experiments, by the time it was time of spring, summer, or eight, people, you know, were still buying in this range. So I realized this is something that I should always be making. So we still make part of that range today, and I created something what I call design classics. And design classics is something that I think that every designer should strive to make because who wouldn't like to have an item that you design once and you keep selling it for 50, 100 years? In the same way as, let's say, Hermes created a Birkin bag, which was created in the 50s and is still a bestseller today. So the mistakes which I made before with butterflies, for example, I made the whole collection, was very successful. And because of the seasonal nature of fashion, everyone wanted new and new and new. I didn't continue that range. So I kind of stopped doing it and the high street copied it and the manufacturers copied it. And once that's kind of slid out of my hands, I kind of didn't own the territory anymore. Whereas this time I learned I'm going to keep doing it until people realize it's mine. So even though the range got copied a lot by the high street, by that time everyone knew that it was kind of my range. So the three items still stay. The first one, sorry, that was Rosetta necklace, still in production today. Uh, La Rotella bracelet, I don't know if you remember, but we changed the clasp on this, so now it's a little bit more um, commercial clasp in a way that's easier to make, it doesn't require so much looping. And uh, the plaid bangle. Then I went the following season back to photo etching. Let's try again doing something, this was with enamel, kind of inspired by the diamond and baguette and all these different stone shapes. Uh, try to create something that's very light. The earrings are very large, but they're very, very light because photo etching allows you to do that. And some necklaces. The most successful items were the simpler items, like the cuff on the left. I don't know if it's possible to do with the price or ease of wear or just kind of less complicated things. And then I w also put this on a purses, like something I learned before. You know, if you can, you have to transfer the same idea across as many different items as possible uh, to have bigger penetration in the market. So people, some people might buy the purse, some people might buy the earrings, but they will recognize the same kind of signature hand. And then more purses just with plates on purses without kind of trying to do a jewelry round, because by that time, the technique became so well known that people would recognize it. And with the bags. And spring, summer, seven, I did this collection, it was called Eclipse Collection. It was one of the most successful collections we did. Uh, it came again from playing with chains. By this time, I became obsessed with chain catalogs. So I was ordering chain catalogs for all around the world, trying to find this kind of chain. So I found this snake chain that is hexagonal, and that's a very important part because most of the snake chains in the market are either round or square. And when the chain is hexagonal, you've got this very small, flat area, which means when two chains are together, you can solder them together. And I noticed if you solder it in a way that is spot soldered, not as a line, but just little dots, that the chain still keeps flexibility. So you could solder five, six, seven, eight strands or something together. As long as you kept it onto spot soldering, you could create curves and shapes. So I started experimenting with curves, and that's how this necklace became born. And then I started looking at a lot of pictures of highways and spaghetti junctions. So it was kind of partly inspired um, by that. Um, what, I, what I used, the same motif in the necklace, which you see this kind of curve. Then I started using it also on the smaller items. So curve and turn around the, sh the loop to the top and then let the chains hang. And then earrings, they're called Saturn earrings. And then the same kind of idea to translate into the uh, bracelet. Other thing I started playing with was looping them. So I also noticed not that just you can curve the chain, but you can also make a perfect circle. So once it's a perfect circle, I remembered what I learned from the Marina collection, which is all about the looping. So I looped these kind of two shapes around this circle to create this kind of knot. And then more playing just with circles in a bracelet and then with the pendant, this is a polo pendant, which became one of the most successful pendants we had. And then I tried to do bags that wouldn't have any jewelry around because by that time I got sick of problems with jewelry. Either the problems were the chains were breaking or the other problem was the plates were very expensive. To make one of these plates it's like something like 
40, 50 pounds. And by the time you add leather and manufacture, the price of the bag is just enormous. So I said, okay, let's try and make the bag without the chains, but keeping the kind of the design. So I basically translated this idea with the leather profile. So it's still got the kind of the signature half moon shape, uh, these tongue loops underneath, and try to create a shape also with a handle, with kind of looping and <coughs> twisting around. This bag was very successful. It's called the Lunar Bag. Still in production today, part of our design classics range. And also the belt, same, no metal. It's very easy, it's just a leather profile stitched together and then looped around to hold it in place. And then I said, okay, now we've got this great design, let's translate it back into the photo etching because everyone knows me for that. So I translated the clips design also back into the photo etching technique. And those were some, some of the clutches and purses using the same motif. Okay, then I said, I am so sick of chains because they have so many problems, you know, so long delivery lines. The problem was also we were making this whole range in brass. So whenever something broke, the whole piece, including six meter of chain, was basically destroyed and you couldn't fix it because once the chain is broken, you can't kind of keep soldering it. Um, so even though the, chain, the, the, the range was very successful, it wasn't making us much money at all. So I so, said, okay, let's go to something that's really traditional, which is casting, and try and make these kind of movable components. So I made the necklaces with all these kind of plates in pyramid. And this didn't do well at all. So I was very disappointing. Tried to do something that would be better for the business, but actually didn't sell. And then I said, okay, let's go back to chains. Let's do castings with the chain. So I combined this kind of chain uh, kind of straps with a bit of casting and with some stones. This is really well impressed. We got lots of attention. It wasn't a great seller, so never made it into the design classics range. The ring. And then I started to experiment with castings in a different way. So I cut out a circle out of a sheet and I bend that and you get this kind of kind of tool shape, well, I don't know how to call it. The collection is called the Love Child Collection. At the time I was pregnant, so it was like this pearl inside felt a little bit like a child in a, in a womb. It was kind of very rounded, organic, and did relatively well. So I'm starting to understand round works, pyramid doesn't work so well. So I'm learning from that. This was the necklace. The only problem that you have with casting, it can be very heavy. So this necklace was actually very heavy compared to the clips necklace, which is quite light and sensual. So I said, okay, let's go back to chain. So I tried to experiment with another chain. It's also a snake chain, but it's half round. <coughs> and that made a huge difference because the chain was actually breaking a lot. So we had a lot and lots of rejects of that. Um, the collection was kind of African inspired. So the pieces were quite big and bold, quite minimal, especially on the bracelets because the chain is quite thick, quite chunky. And I did some smaller pieces like earrings, but you know, you couldn't do much smaller in that kind of range. And then back to photo etchings again to some of the successful designs you saw that on a bag before, uh, because people still kept asking about it. So I said, okay, let's do, but let's do new, different designs. And at that time I learned that, uh, that with the photo etchings, the pieces that work better are the bigger pieces that don't have too many components. So all these pieces are quite kind of streamlined. They don't have too many dingly dangly soldered components onto them. And again, utilizing the same kind of design um, on the bags. And then I went back to the catalog. So I basically bought a full catalog of a range that the factory wasn't making anymore. These were like little components that they made in the 50s and they were just sitting in their drawers. So I bought the whole box of those components and started playing with them. And I realized that I can make a collection that was called the garden, which was almost like a twigs and pods and uh, kind of bunches of flowers. It was quite successful, this collection. It's quite large, but it's quite light. It's not heavy because the components are stamped and quite thin because at the time I couldn't really afford to invest into big stamping tools. And because this was so kind of all these components, I knew that they really wouldn't be anything really like it on the market. So the bangles and the ring. Went back to castings, 
This collection is called Metropolis. It was inspired by a New York skyline uh, with lots of pave to kind of make it a little bit lighter. I think that worked quite well compared to before when it was just kind of castings. In the same way as in traditional jewelry, which is mainly used castings and stone. So that's kind of a kind of proven formula. And then I went back to silver. One of the reasons was I got really sick of repairing brass items that were plated because every time there's something wrong with it, you have to unplate it, solder it, and plate it again. And with the price of gold on the plating, it just didn't make any sense. It was almost the same price as making things in silver. So this collection is all silver with onyx and white topaz, and some of it's plated on the right. Uh, it was called Collision, and it was inspired by 3D mathematical formulas. It's about the colliding spheres. Uh, this bracelet is very large, and it's a large ring. And at that time, I started to develop this concept that's called Mini Maxi. This is Mini, and that's Maxi. So uh, at that time, we were already entering recession. People don't have much money. They still want to buy something, but they want to buy something that's cheaper. So I think this bracelet retails at something like 2,000 pounds. And the ring on this one is something that I think is like 250 pounds. So it's basically the same design as on the bracelet, but just totally shrunk down. And also the tiny little studs and a small little pendant. Um, and this is something that I do more or less now all, all across the board, all across the collections, which is possibly more response to the market. That's something that I would like to do. But in a way, also, it's providing something for everyone because, you know, small little studs like that, almost everyone can wear. This is Solaris collection. It's the same silver, onyx, white agate, uh, sometimes plated. Uh, it's sun and moon bracelet, which is the big kind of star piece of the collection. And then all other pieces kind of derive from that. So the sun and moon ring, still one of our best sellers. The pendant on the left is much bigger pendant to the pendant on the right, which is kind of trying to commercialize the, the same concept. And this is more or less the full range we sell today. Best sellers, the studs, they're tiny. And then the, all the things that you see on the right, whereas the bracelet is something that we sell very, more like a special piece. It's not for, you know, it's, it's not like uh, we sell hundreds a day. It's one of few. And again, translating the same kind of idea uh, into bags with the two Solaris component and translating the, this circular language. Uh, this is the eye collection. Again, it's trying to uh, use again this motif of a circle, uh, but making it combining with the cone, so it's kind of a little bit more kind of aggressive with more punky shapes. I mean, I wouldn't consider that a big piece, but most people still do. So also we made some smaller pieces, a very small pendant and quite light drop earrings. And then this is the full range. The best sellers, the studs on the top and the pendant at the bottom, obviously. Then I went back to this cutout techniques for which I became very known but with casting. So what this allowed me to do is when you do a casting, if you have a cutout technique, it doesn't have to be flat because with photo etching, you're quite limited. You can only bend it in two dimensions, in two ways. You can't really have another curved shape on top. So all these collections that you see in silver, we were using uh, CAD and 3D printing with that. So all of those were done with that technique. So you can see this is kind of becoming more curved and more three-dimensional as opposed to more flat rings before. And that's the range that we still sell today. This was the balcony collection. It was inspired by uh, Bangkok uh, skyline. They have lots of kind of like 60 style buildings that have these kind of balconies. Mm -hmm. Very big pieces and uh, very expensive. And at that time, I kind of, after we got the, the, the big pieces, but even though I personally very like them, they kind of, they were very difficult to commercialize because you can't really shrink that shape down. So we kind of dropped that range pretty much straight away. This is a Nadia collection, which was inspired by Nadia Kumaneci. She was a gymnast when I was a little girl and I was growing up. Um, and this particular part of the range is inspired by a ribbon dance. So it's all about the ribbon. So it's trying to make a 3D shape from something that's flat. I personally quite like voluminous shape, but it's very difficult to make voluminous shape not heavy and also not expensive. So I thought to play with the flat 
idea and then bend it would create some sort of volume. So these pieces are relatively light, but they still kind of carry lots of weight and volume around. So that's the Nadia ring and Nadia cuff. Uh, this was the curl necklace, uh, what was it called, the gymnastic choker actually. And uh, it's the same, it's not very heavy, but it's creating lots of volume, uh, likewise in the pendant. And this was the winner ring and winner cuff. Again, playing a lot with this kind of uh, empty space to try and create volume. This is part of the range with the little studs that are bestseller. And the other winner cuff and ring with a pendant. And then also try to commercialize the Nadia um, bracelet and the ring, which you saw in the, in the beginning, and making them thinner. And this proved as very successful. This is what's called Apollo Collection, and it's basically derived from the Eclipse Collection. Um, and it's kind of, I call it a merchandising collection because it basically came about as a <coughs> response to buyers asking for small items under 200 pounds and something that's like Eclipse. I said, look, you can't get something like Eclipse because Eclipse is big and the chain is big and it's heavy. So there's no way we can do it. So what I did, I took the Apollo component from the pendant and I shrank it down to two centimeters and made this kind of earrings and then kind of used the same components I had in Gagarin brace. I made a little cuff, satoire and the pendant. And this one is very successful, selling lots. And this is the full range. Obviously, the little studs at the bottom, bestsellers in this recession times. And then also I put the same motif of the Apollo component on the bag. Um, I mean, this works really well for like merchandising for, you know, in the shop, they can put the bags and the jewelry together. Uh, but also it becomes recognizable because people who know the pendant, they will recognize the bag uh, that's from the same designer. This is called Planetaria Collection. And it came again from playing with the idea, how do you make a 3D sphere from a flat circle? So I, I cut out the flat circle, I bent it in half. I'll show you the next slide, just for a second. I bent it in half and you get sort of this moon shape, like what you see on these earrings. And then if you turn, take this moon shape and rotate it around three times, so you need three moon shapes, it becomes like a sphere. So then, uh, then I cut out this circle and I made it hollow. And inside, I put a quartz bead. So all of, the, all of the beads that you see inside here are moving. Now, th there's an important thing I learned, which is min and maxi. So we're making all these things, the earrings in small, which is 12 mil or 20 mil, or the big ring, which is 30. We also have a big ba bangle and a bigger pendant. And here you see on the all three rings. So we do a ring that size 12 mil, 20 mil, and 30 mil. So it's something for me and something for the buyers. This is the rest of the range with studs, earrings, the whole thing. Uh, this was a knot bangle. It was born from the Nadia collection. It was just playing with the flat ribbon, trying to make it 3D. And then again, this is the full range with the bigger pieces and small, tiny pieces. And then again, I said, we started making scarves. So I said, okay, how do we enter the market with something we've never done before? We've never done scarves. We're not known for scarves. So I, I utilized the motif for which we're very well known for, which is the eclipse, um, lunar eclipse necklace. So I basically took photographs of that necklace, photographs of the pearls, and just played around with that. This was with the Loratella bracelet on the left and more eclipse designs on the right. And this was the Apollo ring. So this was a very successful entry into a totally kind of new arena for us, just with utilizing kind of the same motif. So what I learned is how you develop a signature style is that you repeat the same motif over different techniques. So for example, butterfly and photo etching, and in Velbex, uh, that kind of vinyl material, uh, or you do eclipse in the jewelry and then in the bags with the leather kind of uh, motifs. Then use the same motif in all sizes. So like you saw, for example, in Collision, like the very small studs to a very big bracelet. Same in Planetaria and Solaris. And then develop similarity of shapes. So for example, circle in a sphere is something that became my signature. So I'm using that in Solaris, Collision, and Planetaria collection, knotting and looping, both in Marina and Eclipse collection, or the natural motifs like Butterfly and Anturia. And then all you need to do is repeat it all over again until it becomes yours. And that's how it becomes your signature. You basically have to claim your space 
over that motif, style or technique or whatever you do. I also want to show you some of the presentations we did because how you present your vision of your style to the world is also very important because you may get journalists and press asking for, uh, uh, for pieces and they will photograph it in their own way. How they will portray it is something you don't control. So doing photographs is a very good way of showing um, kind of your style. This was the fine jewelry campaign. Uh, it was the Solaris collection. I wanted to feature that this is kind of like a timeless modernity, I would like to call it. So it's kind of like something that could be done in the 30s or could be maybe done 20 years from now on. So the lighting is almost from like a black and white pictures from the 30s, but with using this geometric background and coloring in the jewelry. And this was some still life using the same kind of background motif. So in Solaris collection. Uh, this was the collection I did for Palladium Visions. Uh, basically, they, they asked me to design a range from Palladium, which I never used. Uh, they wanted to have very big show pieces, something that would be very press worthy, but they had very little material and very little money. So they basically asked me to stretch it out as much as I could. So I created the cage motif, so we used very little material. Uh, it was all done in CAD and then cast with diamonds and uh, with pearls. What is really good about palladium is it's very light. So, I mean, very light. It's, let's say, 30% lighter than gold. We're not talking aluminium. So it's very good for earrings. So you can create relatively large earrings. So we use the same motif of this kind of sphere. The whole range was inspired by a King's Cross station in London. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's got this kind of beautiful construction of the arches, which you will see on the bracelet later on. This was the ring, which was kind of like asymmetric a little bit. The pearl inside is moving as well. So that's, you can see the design best, I would say, on the bracelet. It's really like the, this kind of arches of kind of construction. Um, this was one of the first fashion jewelry campaigns we done at that time with the jewelry bags, scarves, and shoes at the time for like a couple of seasons. So it's the Garden Choker. We shot this in Paris. It was this kind of great place, looked a bit like derelict. I wanted to create this kind of idea that something, something happened. We don't really know what happened, but this girl has the chair is on the wall. There are animals around. Someone is taking her bag. There's smoke. It could be like some war happening. It's just kind of like I wanted to create some kind of cinematic experience. She's hiding under the sofa. And we don't know, is she dead? Is that woman going to kill her or what's going to happen? So it was um, one of the first campaigns that we did that, was, that I personally really liked and was very successful. Again, why is the fox looking through the window? Um, and this was another campaign that we shot in London. It was very difficult to shoot scarves. How do you shoot a scarf when you don't make clothing? So I made loads of cushions out of scarves and we covered her with that little scarf to kind of try and show that it is a scarf. So you can use it as a cover up. And again here, because obviously we don't do clothes, so just use lots of flowers and wanted to create this kind of decadent 70s, almost like a Biba kind of like experience. Again, a little bit kind of cinematic. I always like the idea that in a picture some, you should be thinking about like something something happened or what is the story behind, what happened before or after? Why is she lying on a table with a, with a lamp kind of knocked over? <laughs> and the bags again, how do you shoot a bag with no clothes? <coughs> and then the smaller items as well. Uh, this was a campaign we shot last year in Ibiza. Great fun shooting this. We were out in the sea on a boat so the idea was of kind of a woman who's kind of like uh, holidays, luxurious travel. I mean, who doesn't like to go on holidays? And who doesn't like to be in an environment like that? So it's creating a desirable kind of escapist environment to which you would like to go to. And using the scarves as a turban, this was another way how to portray the scarves. This was the planetaria collection. And then the design classics collection, we shot it under some rocks around there with swimsuits, vintage swimsuit this time, no naked.
And that's the, the last shot is the Lunar Eclipse necklace, which is still one of our best sellers. And that's it. <laughs>